Hello. In the last video, we went over Marx's understanding of capital and value, and we went over Hegel's science of logic in order to demonstrate the ways in which capital and value impose themselves as social totality over society. This previous video had to operate at a relatively abstract level in order to get across the general understanding of the theoretical basis that I hope to be working under moving forward. This video acts as an extension of that first video and demonstrates the ways in which capital's increasing domination over societies that had not been fully emerged in modern capitalist relations increasingly have their cultural symbols and social orders reshaped in the light of capital's imposition. Culturally significant objects that fit into indigenous symbolic orders take on new meanings and increasingly are valued less in their traditional ways and more as commodities, or as barriers of value. In addition to this, the imposition of value also noticeably affects how these societies relate to their natural environment. Capital's imposition imposes a new metaphysical order. It intrudes not only on the symbolic order to undermine it, but also creates a real metaphysics of social life. Metaphysics typically is a field of philosophy that attempts to grapple with fundamental questions like what is being, what is a thing, what is time, space, etc. So, to use an example from the previous video, Hegel's Science of Logic is a metaphysical work. In part one of that book, Hegel attempts to grapple with the question of being and its necessary determinations, such as what is being, what are the relations of being, what are qualities, quantities, and so on. What I argue here is that capitalism, via the social relation of capital, and its emergence in non-capitalist societies imposes not only a new symbolic order, but as a relation of real metaphysical domination in which humans are dominated by abstractions rooted in the material relations of production. So in this video, we'll take a look at three different cultural contexts and see how the growth of modern social relations reshapes cultural contexts and reorients culturally significant objects. In addition, we will also touch on how these new social relations alter these communities' relations to the natural environment. What we will find is that the adoption of capitalist social relations not only reorients culture and ecological relations, but imposes a new form of metaphysicality onto these societies. Modern social relations do not demystify traditional societies, but in fact imposes a new set of abstractions and fetishes that capitalism and enlightenment thought supposedly dispels. We will find that capitalist social relations are not simply economic, but usher in a whole set of metaphysical, ecological, and philosophical assumptions about the world. In Papua New Guinea, there live a group of people known as the Gimme. The Gimme previously had contact with Westerners via the Australians. While the Gimme's relationship to capitalism was previously a product of colonial projects, Today, they actively embrace these social relations, seeing them as ultimately beneficial for their society. The new ways of social life have imposed new ways of living and perceiving among the gimme. Two objects will be focused on here, the local harpy eagle and the locally produced billum bags. The harpy eagle in traditional gimme meaning is a culturally important animal within the context of the natural environment. Traditionally, the eagle serves, among other things, as an object of cultural meaning. For example, they are used to illustrate why women should not garden by themselves and should remain near others and their children to remain safe and keep their children safe, among having other imbued meanings. Increasingly, however, with the introduction of modern relations and the Gibbies' increasing interconnectedness with global researchers, conservationists, and NGOs, the harpy eagle increasingly becomes an object removed from its local ecological context. It increasingly becomes an object taken by researchers in isolation from the rest of the local environment. This is something acknowledged by the Research and Conservation Foundation, an NGO that operates in the region. This form of conservation increasingly renders the harpy eagle a fetishized object, rendered detached from its traditional meanings. As a result of this emphasis on the harpy eagle by researchers and the like, new social relations arise to mediate the relationship of the gimme and NGOs around this animal. Gimme can now act as guides, carriers, research assistants, etc. The eagle's role in traditional context thus shifts. It acts as a sort of commodity for the gimme, which allows them access to so-called development through researchers who come into Papua New Guinea. The harpy eagle thus increasingly acts as a commodity and an object around which the gimme have access to so-called modernization. It becomes removed from its traditional roles and instead becomes an object oriented around the sale of services and NGO work. In addition to the harpy eagle, the other object of focus here is the locally produced billum bags. These are handmade bags produced by local gimme women. These bags hold traditional cultural importance within Gimme society. These bags mark a girl's passage into womanhood and are a sign that young girls begin to take on womanly responsibilities. It is one of the few items Gimme women have that they themselves actually owned, and it is used daily. 
The bags also have important cultural significance as well. The Gimme word for bags are ko, which is also the word for uterus. Gimme women will often carry their babies in these bags, and when a woman has her first child, the woman's mother will often make a bag for her to carry this baby. This is an act that is deeply symbolic, in that the mother reproduces her own ko, which her daughter rested in, and is now done again for her grandchild. The bag thus serves both a symbolic role as a rite of passage, as well as a specifically gendered role. These bags are produced specifically by women and are extremely labor-intensive to create. With the introduction of modern capitalist relations among the gimme, these bags become commodities, sold through third parties, and they are windows into the so-called development that the gimme now pursue. The billum bag increasingly has shifted from being a culturally significant object embedded in traditional meanings and has become more and more like a typical commodity, something to be produced for profit in a productive manner and measured by averages in social production. The bag's switch to being a commodity also alters the gender division of labor among the gimme, as a bag is now sold to outside organizations for the sake of producing profit amongst the gimme, the bag is increasingly subordinate to values dictates. These are produced in an increasing quantity, and productivity is measured for the sake of profit output. The shift of the billum bag towards being a commodity imposes upon women new impulses to produce these bags along new social standards. In her book, Conservation is Our Government Now, Paige West, who I have cited extensively thus far, describes a discussion she had with a local gimme woman interviewed under the name of Barbara. Barbara is now not only expected to carry out her traditionally assigned gendered roles within gimme society, but she is also expected to make money by producing these bags as well as work in her husband's and son's gardens to produce for profit. In this sense, we see a mirrored phenomenon as witnessed in capitalist modernity, where women are typically saddled not only with traditional domestic work, but are also expected to be participants in modern capitalist social relations. Women are saddled with what Regina Becker Schmidt would call the double burden of women. This shift in local cultures and ecologies are not something exclusive to the gimme. This trend seems to be universal in capitalism's emergence. The same process plays out elsewhere too, such as in our next case of Botswana. Botswana is a society that is typically considered to be a post-colonial miracle. However, with its embracement of fully-fledged capitalist social relations, the relationship that people within Botswana have to both their natural environment and traditional cultural order changes as well. Cattle were seen as a vital animal in Botswanan society. Their dung would be used to insulate homes or would be burned as fuel. Cattle hides would be used to make slings to hold children or craft chairs, and their milk could be used to make various staple foods like madilla. Culturally, cattle played an important role too. They would act as a social linkage that seeped into most aspects of cultural life. They would be exchanged in marriage as a dowry to link families, and they would act as a form of individual and collective property that would be passed down over time. Cattle thus served both a highly functional purpose while also playing an important cultural role acting as a sort of metaphysical object. Despite these traditional roles, however, today cattle have shifted as an object in Botswanan society. They now act more as a commodity, and much of their former cultural significance has been lost. In other words, cattle have become beef. This process can be seen generationally. Hoyt Alverson, an anthropologist working in Botswana in the 1970s, interviewed elders about cattle. For the older generation, cattle acted in their traditional cultural roles. Alverson noted that, the sale of a cattle was a desperate measure dictated by need, and that it was considered a failure to sell a cow. In contrast, today, cattle are seen primarily as a source of profit and destined for consumption in EU markets. The relationship of humans to cattle have changed, but also has the relationship of humans to the natural environment more broadly. In the 1930s, wealthy cattle owners increased the amount of water bored for the sake of cattle production. With increased water supply, the number of cattle increased too. But the shift from traditional roles to capital-driven ones led to a relationship where water would now be drained far faster than it could naturally replenish itself. Water shortages, as a result of this, became an increasing problem. We thus see here the ways in which the rise of capitalist social relations as increasingly predominant change the material and cultural relations within Botswana. Cattle become beef, and become valued not for their use value in traditional relations, but increasingly become an object whose main purpose is value in a Marxian sense. Catalyst commodities are now marked by the dual character of the commodity as its prime mediation. Social homogeneous value side, contra their use value, becomes predominant. For a more detailed extrapolation of a Marxian conception of the commodity, 
please see my first video. This shift in the relationship with cattle is a microcosm of the larger shifts in social relations within Botswana. These capitalist social relations have also brought about shifts in infrastructure and relation to the natural environment. Major roads in Botswana were built for the sake of transporting commodities. In fact, Botswana's first major road emerged out of the cattle industry. We can here see how capital alters the relationship to the built environment and local ecology. Value's impetus for faster and more effective turnover brings about shifts in local infrastructures, which in turn erodes local organic forms of movement. The construction of these roads is also tied up with shifts in ecological practices that become increasingly destructive to the natural environment. Roads require an immense amount of water and asphalt to be constructed. This, in turn, requires increased mining of riverbeds that leads to an erosion of river ecosystems and the pollution of local water supplies. All of these shifts of the symbolic order of cattle in the commodities, of the relationship of local ecologies, and in transportation, all mark the ways in which capital, as a generalized social mediation, reorients society at a large level. Marx's concept of capital as the quote-unquote automatic subject can help us contextualize these large-scale shifts in social relations. The production of value and the accumulation of capital become the prime social movers in society. We can also see here Henri Lefebvre's notion of shifting practices, representations, and symbols in social spaces as a result of these changing relations. The history and structural causes behind these shifts I have discussed so far can be linked to the emergence of value as a socially structuring category which describes a so-called deep structure that is historically specific to capitalist modernity. Shifting local ecologies surrounding cattle specifically can also be seen amongst the newer in what is today southern Sudan. Amongst the newer, cattle played an important role not only practically in material production, but also culturally, as in Botswana. The anthropologist Sharon Hutchinson's work among the Nuer unpacks the ways in which cattle serve an important cultural role. Cattle for the Nuer affirmed a fundamentally metaphysical role. The Nuer hold a fundamental belief in so-called oneness with cattle. These cattle are tied directly to kinship networks, acting as bride's wealth, but also as a means of expanding kinship and expanding one's own sense of self beyond death. The concept of blood amongst the Nuer is a shared link of humans and cattle. It acts as a life force that is eminently social. It passes from generation to generation and endowed social relations with a substance and fluidity. As Hutchinson writes, quote, Cattle were the principal means by which people created and affirmed enduring bonds amongst themselves, as well as between themselves and divinity. By tracing the history of this bond with cattle amongst the Nuer, in light of its historical changes, we can see how the introduction of explicitly capitalist social relations alter this cultural symbolic order. During the period of British colonialization of Sudan, the Nuer had little in terms of money relations, and few engaged with money, and fewer with market relations in a larger context. Early on in the colonial process, the British wanted a way to open up Nuer cattle to markets, but many Nuer did not want to part ways with their cattle for money. In response, the British attempted various means to open up the Nuer to exchanging money for cattle. In the 1940s, the British began holding cattle auctions, allowing Nuer to access young heifers in exchange for male cattle. It was with this early introduction of exchange that relations began to change. The Nuer were now able to have access to differing types of cattle. In the 1950s, the British recruited Nuer men as seasonal wage workers, and with this money, the Nuer men could purchase cattle in the north and bring them south as they returned to their communities in the off-seasons. Due to conflicts in the post-colonial era, many of these markets vanished for a time, only returning in the 1970s and 80s. The retreat of previously established merchants in the north allowed Nuer men to become small-time merchants. At this point, the relationship between cattle and the Nuer had shifted, as in the case of Botswana. Older cultural symbolic social orders were reordered and altered by capitalist exchange relations. The cattle had yet again become beef. What we can see in all of these anthropological examples is that the introduction of modern capitalist social relations fundamentally rearranges and restructures the metaphysical, cultural, and social orders of these societies. Objects that had previously established meanings within these cultures and were considered of such vital role that they would not even be considered as commodities gradually took on new capacities as commodities and objects of value and capital. However, with this undermining of traditional society, the metaphysical order was not so much destroyed as it was replaced. What we find is that capitalism and modernity are not free of metaphysical existences, 
but instead realize a new, real, metaphysical order rooted in the historically specific social relations of capitalist modernity. Capitalist modernity is not just a set of economic relations. It ushers in a whole set of philosophical, cultural, and metaphysical assumptions about the world. These are not separable from each other, nor can they be put into any sort of one-way determination relative to each other. As Moishpastone argues in his book, Time, Labor, and Social Domination, the capitalist social relations and the categories that grasp it, like value, commodity, capital, etc., grasp the specific forms of being and determinations of existence in the specific society. These social relations, in turn, ground and constitute in a nonlinear fashion the various forms of thought and consciousness, constituting thus both objective social structure and corresponding subjective forms of thought. This occurs at multiple layers in society. Ideologically and culturally, this emerges in the West with the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment values of freedom and equality really are recognized in the sphere of capitalist exchange. Each individual operates as a formally free and equal possessor of their respective commodities. When the worker exchanges his labor power, he and the individual who hires him engage on a formally free and equal footing. The sphere of circulation is the sphere where the alleged innate rights of man realize themselves. Each individual confronts each other as formally equal, each owns his commodities to sell of their own free will, and to pursue his own interests. However, beyond this one-sided realm of exchange, when one enters what Marx calls the quote-unquote hidden abode of production, these Enlightenment ideals invert, and the apparent relations of freedom and equality become those of exploitation, social domination, and alienation. One can, in fact, also ground the more recent developments of Islamist radicalism in parts of the Middle East on this basis, too. Universalist projects of groups like Al-Qaeda are based, in part, around establishing a society based on equal footing before the law, although the specific ideological manifestation of this is clearly distinct. This is all to say that capitalism fundamentally creates not only new economic conditions, but new forms of consciousness and thought, too. This is to say capitalism's destructions of old metaphysical orders in the above anthropological examples point to the fact that capitalism does not destroy metaphysical orders entirely, but instead replaces them with its own. As Adorno and Horkheimer argue in the Dialectic of Enlightenment, the system of thought ushered in via modernity as much serves the role of myth as actual myth does in traditional societies. They argue, in fact, that the forms of thought brought about by modernity, specifically the form of positivism itself, becomes myth. Quote, myth becomes enlightenment, and nature mere objectivity. Human beings purchase the increase in their power with estrangement from over which it is exerted. Enlightenment stands in the same relationship to things as the dictator to human beings. He knows them to the extent that he can manipulate them. What Adorno and Horkheimer call enlightenment is the mode of thought and practice that arises with modernity. The old order of myth is replaced by a system of thought that itself serves the same role of systematizing and making sense of the world as myth did. The enlightenment reduction to quantitative accounts in modern positivism and the systemization of nature by attempting to operate at a level of sense immediacy in that systemization reduces the natural world down to an object to be categorized and manipulated. What occurs in thought here is what occurs in the reality of capitalist social relations. This correspondence of thought and relations of production are one process. Quote, Bourgeois society is ruled by equivalence. It makes dissimilar things comparable by reducing them to abstract quantities. For the Enlightenment, anything which cannot be resolved into numbers and ultimately into one is illusion. This equivalence is not only equivalence of thought, however. This metaphysical drive of reduction is rooted in the real social relations of capitalist modernity. When Marx points out in Capital Volume 1 that the commodity as a social form is, quote, bounding in metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties, he is not being metaphorical. Capitalism's imposition of abstract social domination and compulsion, constituted in the social structure, really do impose on us determinate forms of being, acting, and thinking beyond our control. See my first video for more on this topic. When value, capital, and abstract labor become the core determining social relations of society, the relationship that we have to objects, the natural world, and people become mediated in such a way that they become reduced to their value dimensions, to a homogeneous quantitative standard. The crafting of villain bags, the rearing of cattle, the sale of wildlife tours become concrete manifestations of the value relation. The natural environment ceases to be something whose primacy is a source of life that people are intimately tied to 
and instead becomes a collection of resources to be used for profit. This is to say that when cattle in Botswana, or among the Noor, cease to have their local cultural significance, it is not because capitalism has disenchanted their social world, it is because it has bewitched it anew. When farmers in Botswana begin to destroy their water supplies, it is because they have become folded into a new set of social relations that drive them to act in such a way. The water simply becomes a resource to be used and abused for the sake of the compulsions imposed by capital and value. The cattle do not lose metaphysical qualities. Instead, their metaphysicality changes. They become reduced to quantities of exchange value to be accumulated and expanded as capital. They now function as commodities and are determined as exchange values and moments of capital's valorization process. They gain so-called real metaphysicality by their new historically specific social forms. When the billium bags in Papua New Guinea are produced at an increased rate, it is because they have become objects of capitalist commerce destined for foreigners hyped up on indigenous consumerism. When the Gimme women are now saddled with the so-called double burden of domestic and profit-producing labor, being tied to both the sphere of value-producing and value-dissociated labor, it is because they are now compelled by a new social order and new sets of social relations. These cultural objects discussed above, the relation to the natural world, the alterations and gendered relations, are all products of a specific form of society that imposes specific types of social impositions onto us. Quote, not only is domination paid for with the estrangement of human beings from the dominated objects, but the relationships of human beings, including the relationship of individuals to themselves, have been bewitched by the objectification of the mind. Individuals shrink to the nodal points of conventional reactions and modes of operation objectively expected of them. While we should be cautious making hasty generalizations about pre-capitalist societies, and we should grant that all of the above have their own specific cultural context and social bases, it should also be understood that capitalism imposes a historically unique set of social relations on humans that compel certain forms of thought and action. Clearly, the three above mentioned societies differ, but the changes and shifts in these societies mark a general trend of subsumptions under capitalist modernity, and marks the ways in which this capitalist modernity imposes a relatively standard set of social relations globally. What is borne out is that these societies adopt relations oriented around capitalist categories of capital, value, commodity, and commodity-producing labor. These conflict with pre-capitalist relations and reshape existing ones to fit this new structure. Included in this shift is what can be called a shift in the metaphysical order. This is to say that indigenous ways of thinking and conceptualizing the world are replaced by the impositions of capital and value. These new modes of thought are a so-called real metaphysics, insofar as these forms of thoughts are imposed by and rooted in the determinate forms of social activity capitalism itself ushers in. What the shift marks is a fundamentally altered relationship, both between humans and between humans and their natural environment. Nature becomes stripped of any traditional meaning or relationship it had prior, and becomes primarily a quantifiable object to be exploited for capital accumulation. This understanding of capitalism's relation to nature is vital for us today, because it roots the current climate crisis in our determinate forms of social productions as a species. Humans aren't destroying the natural environment because of some distinctly human quality, but because the social system we live under compels us to act in this destructive manner. The social structures imposes a drive towards limitless expansion of capital, and thus the exploitation of nature and production as an end in itself for the sake of capital. This is something that common liberal critiques, such as the commonly cited story of a hundred companies being responsible for about 70% of global emissions, miss. Yes, it is true that insofar as these companies are the ones holding the goods, so to say, they are doing the most damage. But it is the entire basis of our economic system that compels this activity in the first place. Such critique also misses the much wider need to critique the entire infrastructural basis of our reliance on fossil fuels, natural gas, and the subsequent need to alter this basis. If the government or smaller firms held these assets and were still compelled by the same structures and still maintain the same infrastructural basis for our production, we would only have a more equitable distribution of ecological destruction. None of this is to posit any sort of reactionary or romantic critique that opines for traditional societies, but it is to say that modernity leaves us no less mystified than before. In fact, it renders our society one of real metaphysicality, 
that we self-impose on ourselves through our relations of production. Under our own abstract compulsion, we relate to the natural environment in a manner that is not sustainable. Capitalism is a society that has historically created the conditions for an emancipated species, but at every instance resubordinates that potential to profit and furthers the ecological crisis. It is a society whose dynamic is double-sided. It simultaneously posits the possibilities of material wealth, free development, free time, and richly fulfilling lives. But its social relations oriented around value, capital, and abstract labor make realizing this impossible. The same dynamic is also one that worsens the natural environment. Thus, it is only by a determinate negation of existing totality, an actual overcoming of the social relations we live in and their related forms of thought, that we can not only cease to destroy nature in a limitless manner, but also realize a free society on the basis of the social individual.